we are talking about working with freelancers and I do not have the cool poll everywhere. So you're going to have to go old school. I'm going to do a raise of hand, uh, raise your hand. How many of you have worked in the past with a freelancer? Great. How many of you are thinking about working with a freelancer in the future? That's probably why you're here. Um, and this gentleman just asked me, uh, what is a freelancer? So I said, um, a freelancer is someone that is not a full-time employee that you have a contract with, that's key, um, to deliver a certain piece of work or deliverable. Uh, in the earlier session, I talked about my consulting. I actually started in the corporate world. I've worked on very large projects and I got a lot of experience. How do you make sure it's clearly communicated what you need? Um, because I've seen that most situations where you're paying someone to do something break down because there's not clear communication or clear documentation. And in addition to that, we're going to talk about where you can find these amazing people. And here it is, what we're going to talk about today. And since people were furiously taking notes, I created a QR code during the break. This will give you, you can go there and sign up and you can get both my presentations sent to you. Not until after though, so you can't scroll ahead during my talk. <laughs> and what I'd like you to do is to come up with, and then I'll show you that again at the end if you don't get it right now. We are gonna talk about what do you need and I'm actually going to have you talk to each other. <laughs> I, uh, this, I'm gonna make you do five minutes of interacting with people around you in a minute. Okay, I know it's awful, I'm so mean. Um, what do you need? It, I cannot overstate the importance of this. I so often see people go in and say, I need a freelancer. And they end up with this bucket list and they want basically a unicorn. Now unicorns are cool in games, but unicorns don't exist in the real world. So we have to start with the boring stuff first. What do you need? And you might think, I know what I need. Well, I'm going to challenge you to prove to me that you can do it very quickly. So for those of you who are what, the achievers? Is that right? If you're the achiever? And I suppose if you have a take that mechanic, you want to prove I'm wrong, go for it, okay? <laughs> um, when you have your list, you first you brainstorm a list of what are all the things that I need for my game or any project and divide it into three things after you brainstorm it. The things you must do. The things that if you don't do it, that's kind of pointless. Like it's your game, right? So you don't outsource the idea of the game. You know, you don't outsource the, the, the core of it. That would be silly. And if you're, let's say an artist, maybe you want the art to be part of it, right? And you then would not outsource it. What are things that you could do and what are things that you really need to outsource? Like for me, I am not an artist. So if I want graphics, I need to hire somebody to do it. Like if I want an illustrator, you know, custom illustration, I have to pay someone, no question. This might seem really simple, but what I see a lot of people do is they just dive into a project and I wasn't here for it and I wish I hadn't missed it. I had to call the project management um, from earlier. I'm sure they talked about that. You know, you, you gotta have a plan. So. You have this list and when you get, we're going to just talk about must outsource. So I guarantee you all, if you're working on a board game and you want to publish it or produce it, there's at least one thing you need to outsource in that game somewhere. Um, take it and you want to break it down into the smallest possible building blocks. What's an example of that? A lot of times people say, I need a website. Right? Well, <laughs> that could be a lot of different things. You know, it could be as simple as a single landing page. Do you need a shop? Do you need, what do you need on this page? So, you know, breaking it down. What my challenge to you for five minutes, and I'll time it, is talk to the people next to you. Think about whatever project you're working on, because this works so much better, because really talking about freelancers, I know it's not that exciting. So <laughs> we're going to make it relevant. And I want you to talk with someone who's sitting near you or more than one, pick a project, have at least one thing on your must outsource list and break it down to the smallest possible building blocks. And you have five minutes unless you have a question first about what you're doing.
Okay. Ooh. Hello. I'm going to bring you back now. I'm going to bring you back. 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 No, I'm not going to bring you back. <laughs> okay. For, for a group of people that didn't want to talk, you guys are really talkative all of a sudden. So <laughs> thank you. Does anyone have one they'd like to share or you found particularly difficult? Again, I don't have the poll thing, so you're just going to have to be brief. Art. Yes. Art. Is Art. Great, because we're going to do that. Yes. Uh, I, I think uh, Keith brought up uh, playtesting, just getting a wide space of playtesters. Really cool. Yes, playtesting, art. Typography and layout. Typography and layout. These are all very good. So as we go through, we're going to hit on all the, not so much playtesting. Well, that's one reason why I come to Protospiel, frankly. Yeah. But in addition to that, yes. Um, Great. A anyone else want to throw theirs out? Rule book editor. Rule. Oh yeah, rule book editor. Development. Development. What do you mean by that? Uh, balance. Uh, basically, the, instead of the person that designs the car on the outside, it's how the engine runs those things. Okay. So what I would suggest with that is be a little bit more specific because when you said you know, so like balance. Okay. What what part of the balance? You know, is it economy balance? Is it, you know, um, different strategies are both viable? You know, different how specifically you want it looked at. And I'm drilling down because again, different, you need to be clear, but also it helps you find the right freelancer. You know, it's very frustrating when you go looking for something and you have trouble finding it because you're not even sure what you're asking for. Okay, so in deliverable, okay, timing. Um, so we're gonna talk about preparing for a freelancer um, oh, it's all up there. I thought it was on a thing. Okay. Graphics. I cannot overstate. Does any, has anyone here prepared a design brief? Okay, a couple people. If you want to hire someone to do art for you, and you want it to go well, <laughs> I mean, you could want it to go badly. <laughs> if you want it to go well, do a design brief. And I'm going to walk you through that because a, uh, and a, a good artist will ask for one if, they, if you don't offer it. So if they don't ask and you don't offer, uh, you know, you might wanna um, think about it. So the summary of the project, I'm gonna use a project I've been working on. It has, it's steampunk airships, okay? Uh, I needed a steampunk artist. The thing is, different people have different definitions of steampunk. Okay, that's, it's a very broad genre, believe it or not, with lots of subgenres. Like, I didn't even know diesel punk existed. I mean, I learned all sorts of stuff. So when I, when I was putting this together, I actually created my definition of steampunk. What do I want from it? What is important for me to show up in the visuals before I ever went there? So for the people who are, for art, someone said art back there, right? Um, you did. Okay. So, Steve, uh, like, what's an example of something you want art for? Um, death Robot Chickens? Yeah, let's go with that. We actually worked on a game one <laughs> night that was Death Robot Chickens. So, <laughs> but, you know, so, okay, what kind of robot? Are we talking 50s robot, yeah. right? Are we talking, you know, so is it a retro robot? Is it... Um, is it like a 80s style? Is it a cyberpunk style? You know, you, you think it's obvious, you say a robot. But the reality is there are so many different ways to illustrate a robot. If you're not sure, start looking at different art. Okay, and we'll talk more about how you can use that as a resource. Look at board game art. Look at, go to Instagram and just type in robot. I went to Instagram and typed in steampunk. And wow, that was interesting, what I got. <laughs> yes, Steve. Uh, for that one, when we started, there were actual models being sold as a game crafter, and that's what we were going to use. So that's right. That's right. That. Yes, yeah, so there was actual models. It was a, I think it was on the design table, the free design table. It was 11 o'clock at night, and us and one other guy were making robot death chicken games. Um, <laughs> anyway, so defining them, 
Also, what do you need the art for? As an example, do you need them, you, someone had said like, to, I think topography, like do you need a map? You know, do you need them to design you a map? Do you need them to illustrate a character? Do you want them to um, create a, a, you know, a, a ship, like if it's a spaceship or whatever? What specifically do you need art for? And I, I mean, the more specific, the better. You might even want to come up with a list. So if you're going to go out to an illustrator, having, so for me, I wanted six custom steampunk airships, six. And there's a design brief for each ship, very specific. I knew that's what I wanted. Um, if you don't know, they cannot do a Vulcan mind meld, they don't know. So for those of, okay, I'm a Trekkie. <laughs> Sue me. Thank you. <laughs> Someone gets it. All right. Um, contextual and flavor images. Now, I'm not saying you can tell them copy this because copyright law. However, if there's a style you really like and say, you know, A, that, that's what you should look for. And B, you can say, here are some examples of the style I like. These are examples of the general genre of this. Not, could you copy this image for me <laughs> type of thing. But having those and your timing um, and deliverables. So do you need it next week? Do you need it next year? You know, do you need line art? So um, the, when you're doing art, you can just get like rough sketches. There's line art and then there's full color. And then even with full color, it can be, is there a background or is it just the illustration? I'm using you know, that as an example. You need to be clear what you want. My suggestion to you is get as much as you can without a background because then you can use it in more places. So to the marketing from this morning, you know, what can you market? Um, you can take that and turn it into things. I have one of the steampunk airships. I will pass it around. I made it into a pin, a little, in a, a little pin that I got off sticker mule. And you can, um, well, it'll get passed around eventually. Um, no, later because I don't know where, oh no, I know where it is. So these are little pins that I got made from the art. So I'm just gonna, if you guys can pass those around, people can take a look at them. Um, but if it's with a background, suddenly you become very limited in where it can be used. Um, that will also get into like, what do you need? But always ask for high res and all that. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about the design brief or how it might, um, how you might create one? cool, you all have a design brief due on my desk on Monday. <laughs> what if it's something else? Rules review, someone said that. If you want someone to do a rules review, okay, but then now there are questions. Do you just want them to read the rules or is it clear in English, right? Are they, are they supposed to look at how does it interact with the graphics? Um, is it like a, is there a quick start versus a full? I mean, there's, is it the order you want it to appear in? Is it something that's going to be a reference or is there a player guide and how do they interact? You, you know, think about what do you need in your rules because then you can ask someone to review it for that. Um, I don't know how many of you, I know rules are not fun to read, but how many of you actually just pulled out rule books and looked at them when you're working on your own? Yeah, yay, okay. <laughs> so, do that, and then you can give that list to someone. Um, I know GameCrafter actually sells a tool where you can get your uh, uh, service, you can get your rules reviewed. Um, and I, is it just called rules review, or what is it called, Tavis? Uh, sanity. sanity test, thank you. Um, sanity test. <laughs> so that's something very clear, but what if it's something a little less um, specific? So. You talked about like board game development. Okay, do I want do I want balance? Okay, so then again, what are the things specifically? I know I keep saying that, but so many times people say, I want this, and they give a single sentence. Less is not more when you're hiring someone. And if you can point to specific things you want to be similar to, like I really like the balance of board game X. I really like the, the rule book for board game Y. That's very helpful to someone. Okay. 
Once you've decided what you're looking for and you've fleshed out the details of it, where do you find the freelancer? Well, start with published games. <laughs> I don't know if you realize this, but a lot of games list who did a lot of the work on the game right in the rule book, or if you can go to bgg.com and it's listed there. So go look at published games. Now you may not be able to afford that person. I, I understand that. However, it's a good starting point to see. Go look at what are published games. And the next tool is sitting in this room. That's the people around you. <laughs> um, well, you know, so we have, uh, the, you know, this, the game design with, um, and I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on your name, Mr. Pohl dude. Um, what? John. John. Uh, how could I not remember John? Oh my God. Um, that, uh, I'm assuming that, um, you know, he had to use a freelancer at some point, ask him who he used, right? Here are some sites, deviant art. I don't know if you guys know about deviant art. It's not deviant art like deviant. <laughs> it's regular art. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can put the safe search on. <laughs> uh, I found a great, when I was looking for a manga illustrator, I found a really great one on deviant art. Um, another one is Art Station. You guys heard of that? Art Station. So these are sites that are specifically geared towards, these are more like uh, graphic designers and um, illustrators, but there's other things out there. That's the focus though. Um, they'll talk, usually in their profile, they'll talk about are they taking commission work on? Are they willing to do freelance versus full-time? Um, what, what their, you know, are they able to do something short-term, long-term, that sort of thing. You can get, and they usually have examples of their art there. So you can see, do I, li do I like their style? And I know you guys laughed when I said Instagram. The guy who did my steampunk art, I found on Instagram. Because I wanted something, I had an image of my mind of the style I really wanted. And I looked at all these places, I couldn't find it. So I went to Instagram and I started putting in different search things. And eventually this, he's a gentleman out of um, Hong Kong and he actually does a steampunk comic. And I, love his work. I love his work. And I found it and I clicked on his bio and I went out there and then I emailed him and said, can I hire you? <laughs> um, you know, obviously all the other stuff, we'll talk about that. Instagram is where a lot of artists will showcase their work. So you may laugh, but you might also find an amazing artist out there. Okay, going beyond um, the art part of it, Upwork. You guys probably have all heard of Upwork. Yes, no, no, okay. Um, Upwork is basically um, freelancers for almost anything, really. And they, you can list by the type of project you need, you can look at budget, you can put a, basically a request for proposal out. So now we're back to that description of what you need done and people can bid on it. They have, again, reviews. So the nice thing is with that, you can see how people have been reviewed by their past clients. They, you can search by location if you want someone in a certain time zone or you know, location, that sort of thing. And Fiverr, anybody heard of Fiverr? Okay, Fiverr's another one. Um, what you need to be really careful on Fiverr is the, the fine print, meaning a lot of times what you buy on Fiverr, there's limitations on how you can use it. So it's like, oh, that's such a good deal. It's only $15 or whatever. And until you read, not for commercial use, you can't use it here, you can't use it there. So Fiverr can have its uses. I wouldn't suggest to start there. Anybody wanna add anything for places that you look to find freelancers to my list? Yes, John. <laughs> Mm, mm -hmm. It's like just some people will put out their work there and in those mm -hmm. spaces, whether it's a board game design space, whether it's a board game freelancer space, and sometimes it's interesting because you can strike a conversation you know, via that, that platform too. But having said that, I work for my artists through Artstation. So I mm -hmm. 
You've, you yeah, did, a you've done a lot with ArtStation? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And to repeat for the live stream that in the recording, um, go, to, go to interest groups on Facebook, on Discord, you know, wherever else you might be hanging out online, um, specifically game designers. I might, and I know I've seen this board game artists or graphics. I think that's a group on Facebook, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge Facebook fan, so I don't usually do that. Yes? This is more of a warning. DeviantArt is changing a lot of their stuff, so a lot of the artists are closing their accounts. Oh, okay. But, but they're moving to Instagram. Oh, okay. So the warning was DeviantArt is changing their terms of service? They're, they're allowing for AI to use the works on the website without oh. giving the Oh, oh. Yes. Okay, well, so. <laughs> I, I, again, I, I first found DeviantArt years ago for a different yeah. project. So the, the warning is a lot of people are leaving DeviantArt and going to Instagram or potentially ArtStation. Right. Seriously, Instagram search, like especially the hashtags. I found so much cool stuff that way. Any other comments about resources? Yes. 99designs, if you're looking for like a logo. Mm, yes, know. thank you. If you need a logo, don't design your own logo. We had this discussion at lunch. <laughs> I once, I wish I had the image. I had this logo. It was supposed to be like a group of people and everyone kept thinking it was a cog, like a clock cog. <laughs> it's the last time I ever did my own illustration or design work. I pay someone else now. But yes, um, 99designs is another, 99designs.com is a great resource for that. Don't make your own logo. Okay, I'm going to go on to how do you hire a freelancer? So you found them and you're like, okay, I think this is, I think this is really important. I think this is the person I want to work with. There's still a lot to do before you are working with them. And it's very important not to get too emotionally invested in someone you find until you cross your T's and dot your I's because what I'm going to cover next is boring. I know it's not fun, but it can make or break a good situation with a freelancer. First of all, you must discuss turnaround time and deadlines. They are a freelancer, which means you are not their only client. That's, that's just the reality of things. What's on their plate? When can they get to you? When do they promise to get back to you? Um, working with someone in Hong Kong, I mean, that's a you know 12 hour time difference or about. I mean, it's basically the other side of the planet. So I had to be aware that that's gonna create a lag. I had to be aware that, okay, because I actually lived in Hong Kong, I know, like Chinese New Year and things like that. So you, you have to have an understanding that you are not their most important thing. You are a important thing, but not the most important thing because they have 10 more of you beating down their door, calling their phone, flooding their inbox. So make it clear, when do you need it? And, and when will they? Take a paid test drive. Now this, <laughs> a lot of people probably won't like this one, but I feel very firmly about this. When I was looking for my ships, my um, airships, um, I had found a variety of price points of people and skill levels. And so I had one design brief and I had about four or five people that I paid to do a rough sketch for me. And why did I pay them? Because you know how often artists get asked, can you just do this for free? Time is money, <laughs> right? It's your most precious resource if you were at my earlier talk. And you, most, in my experience, most illustrators are, and, and artists are willing to, um, they are willing to do something that's rough, that's not like a full-on product, product, so you can see if you can work together because sometimes it just doesn't gel. It, it just doesn't, they, you guys don't get each other, it's not gonna work. So when I say pay, paid test drive is I gave them all the same brief, I had the same agreement with all of them about what they were gonna deliver, and I got back for incredibly different things. I really did. Now the guy that I thought I was gonna like the best I did, um, but I couldn't have been sure. I've done road tests, on oh, this one, there was one person, I wanted a steampunk airship and I got some kind of like alien organic gas bag thingy that didn't have any steampunk in it at all. I, I don't, I'm not really quite sure what was going on there. They all got the same brief. And that's another reason why to have a brief, no one can say, well, that's not what you told me. 
Because I did have that happen once where someone said, you didn't, I got something and it was the wrong colors. And I said, okay, why are these the colors? Well, you know, I thought that's what you wanted. Um, let me forward the email to you where you agreed and said, no, we're going to use XYZ colors. And they fixed it for free because I had documentation. Otherwise, it would have cost me a revision, the price for a revision. Which leads to get it in writing. How many of you have a freelancer contract? <laughs> okay, there's an attorney coming here later. I really encourage you to talk to them because the contract is what will determine how you can use what you pay them to make. Do you really keep, do they, are they giving up all the rights? And interestingly enough, some types of, um, it's called uh, work for hire, actually revert back if you don't have something in the contract. Yeah. <laughs> so you need to have a contract. It needs to be very clear. I know someone who, this happened before I met her, she wanted someone to create a, a it was like a logo-esque type thing to put on her website. They did that. She decided, I'm going to put it on a shirt. Well, she didn't read her contract carefully. The contract said she couldn't put it on merchandise. And so she had to pay, she'd either get a new logo or pay that person a boatload of money because she didn't have it in the initial contract. So to um, John's point about, like, you can market this stuff in different ways. People will buy art. Like, I know my steampunk artist I'm paying. He has people, he, he's had gallery showings of his art. So people will just buy the art. Um, but you have to be sure you're protected up front and that they can't resell it themselves. So if they're creating a character for you, let's say, you don't want them selling that character to somebody else. It costs more money to get that. They will charge you more. But get whatever thing that is important to you, have it in the contract. Get clarity on revisions. Um, most... This is true, like any kind of project work. If you've ever paid someone to do a website, I don't know how many of you have ever paid someone to work on a website, they will charge you for revisions, understandably. Um, if you are doing something with someone and it's iterative, okay, maybe balancing is another good example here. So with balancing, it's not like, oh, I tweaked this and it's all fixed, right? <laughs> um, another one would be, okay, so... Um, if you're having someone do play testing, that was a, a ask from the back, you might have them run one set of play tests and go, okay, wow, that isn't the kind of information I need from a play test. Before you run it again, we need to modify this. So is that covered in your contract or not? Or are they gonna charge you for it? Because that kind of stuff can get very expensive very quickly. I talked about this, make sure the rights are covered. Um, with playtesting, I don't know if you've come across this, but um, you probably want to make sure if you want to use any quotes from your playtests, you should have a release from all of them. If you want images, pictures taken of someone, you technically should have a release to use their images. So those are other things to think about that are like the, the fall on from if you're using a third party, did they get all the releases that are required? And last but not least, I'm just checking the time. We're doing good on this page. We're not done. Um, <laughs> this was, I, I'm laughing because I made this mistake. I was used to being able to pay people with PayPal, right? Well, it turns out because I've also have someone I contract with for my magazine out of Barbados. So I've got someone in Hong Kong and someone in Barbados. Well, guess what? PayPal doesn't play well with some countries. Oh, I had a Russian, I'm not kidding. Uh, ask me to pay him in cryptocurrency, some weird Russian cryptocurrency. It wasn't even like Bitcoin. I mean, I'm like, come on, dude. Um, <laughs> so seriously, those have all happened to me. But um, before you move too far, you need to make sure you have a payment arrangement that actually is going to work. Because I was surprised. I thought PayPal worked everywhere. And it doesn't. So there are different options. Um, I'm trying to remember. There's a couple. I don't know if anyone has anything that you, you've used outside the U.S. or even in the U.S. Yes? Wise or TransferWise. Mm. That's what I was thinking of. Wise is, TransferWise is a good one. 
Um, I know some people use, what is it, Zelle? Yeah. My bank doesn't connect with that, so um, I'm with a credit union. There's good and bad with that. Yeah, it won't, won't connect. It's a small credit union. Anyway, um, but how will payment be handled and the timing of the payment, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the timing of the payment. Because trust me, your contractor wants to know they're going to get paid. Uh, <laughs> yes? Oh, okay. Awesome. You should be doing this. As a freelancer, if I had a client that came to me with all this stuff, I would want to keep them forever because they would have asking for these things. And they would not, you know, not be ready for it. Or, you know, I would think that we had agreed on when the payment would come and then it wouldn't come. And I would pay my rent. Not that I mean it. Hypothetically. He said, I thought the payment was coming. It couldn't come. And hypothetically, maybe then I couldn't pay my rent. And that's a great point. Thank you. I have found that once I work with a freelancer, it's very easy for me to get them to answer me to work with me again um, because I do do all this. And really, uh, I can't stress enough, it's going to make your life so much easier because otherwise you're going to be frustrated. And it, the lack of clarity, um, and it, it needs to be in writing. I, if I, I if I could have you leave with one thing today, when you work with a freelancer, get it in writing. I, seriously, you walk out and if you just take that, I'm happy. Because so many people are like, oh, I don't need that in a contract. Well, <laughs> I'm sure the attorney later today can give you all sorts of horror stories. Okay. Oh. Um, what's going on? Oh, it's giving me like something ahead of time. Okay, so what, before we get to that, so once you've signed it, then we're going to talk about, okay, working with a freelancer. Um, these are some things, okay, and I'm going to start with one I think is the top pet peeve of a lot of freelancers. When you say, I don't like it, I don't like it. Sound like my kid, right? I don't like it. That's not very helpful. What don't you like? You know, do you not like the color? Does it... Do you not like how someone's standing? Do you not like, I mean, okay, one of the hot topics and illustrations in some places is, do you feel that it's objectifying the person? So that's why you don't want that art. Do you feel like the art is not inclusive enough? Um, whatever it might be, the more specific you can be, not only is it not gonna be as stressful, but the better you'll, the quicker you'll get what you want and you don't have to pay for a bunch of revisions because they can't read your mind. Uh, one thing that I do with every illustrator I work with is I always make them do a rough sketch first if it's something you know where it, that makes sense because they can do that fast. A good artist can do that quickly and you know if you're on the right track or not because trust me, occasionally you're gonna get something and be like, wow, <laughs> no, that's not what I wanted. Um, with the, the play testing, I've, I have never hired outside firms. I know Indie Game Alliance offers where they will outsource. Are you guys familiar with Indie Game Alliance? Um, no, okay. Indie Game Alliance, I think it's just IndieGameAlliance.com. Um, they, oh, I thought you had a comment. Um, they are an association for independent game designers and publishers. So they actually have, as part of their membership, you can get them to run play tests for you. I have never used it. However, it's something I would think would be useful. Um, having someone run a play test, you want to make sure it's very clear what you want them to test because they can't possibly. Now, some people record play tests. I saw um, Matt Leacock, uh, the, who created Pandemic, I saw him speak before the pandemic. Um, <laughs> I saw him speak and he was saying he actually would get permission to have the play test recorded, video recorded, which I thought was really interesting. Um, if you can get that, that's great because there's a lot of nonverbal stuff that's going on. Yes. Yeah, so the, what he was saying is 
he would even watch it at like one and a half speed or and with the he turned the volume down to look at the body language what's what are they reacting to what are they check when are they checking the rules it tells you a lot of things that they may not verbalize at the end of a game right but they did it during the game um I, and I, I'm a firm believer in body language. You can just even see if someone's like, you know, pulling back at a certain point or they look confused. So if you can get it, again, make sure the proper releases are signed. Um, I can't stress that enough. Unfortunately, we live in a litigious world. Um, so with the, so Indie Game Alliance offers that. And obviously there's protospiels. Um, there's first exposure at Gen Con. I think that's only a couple hundred bucks. Has anybody done that? First exposure at Gen Con? You've done it. Okay, Brian, what, what was your experience? It was excellent. So I think it was $200. This is, you know, who knows if I'm right. But right. it was like $200 that included two badges and drinking hours. Oh, wow. And so, like, <laughs> it pays for itself. He said it was like a couple hundred bucks and it included two badges for Gen Con. Eight hours of play testing with people who have read a brief of my, like a description of my game and chose to be there mm -hmm. for two hour block. Mm -hmm. so, Block. And did you find that the feedback was like they were engaged and gave you valuable feedback? Yeah, because they knew what they were going up going to. They okay. Said, you know, pro skills are fantastic, but I'm gonna play everyone's game here, no matter what. And I don't know where I'm going to. Just, right. But, yeah. Right. So that's another great example of it. So it's uh, first exposure. Gen Con has. I think Origins has first exposure also. I'm not 100 percent sure. It's through a group out of, I think, the East Coast. They also put on Metatopia. Unpub. Unpub? Is that who does it? No, okay. Uh, no, not First Exposure. No, not First Exposure, but yeah. Unpub's at Origins. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Unpub's at Origins. Yeah. So, the, you know, there's those types of things. Um, if you're willing to spend the money, which I don't know anyone has this budget, another group, another way you could go at that is um, uh, market research companies because they're used to doing things and getting information. It, that brings me back to in my, in my past life when I was in the corporate world, I worked with market research companies to collect analytical data and bulk, you know, quantitative research and apply it. And one of the things that really came home to me and I would leave with you when you're hiring someone to do any kind of um, research along those lines is be sure the information you're asking for is clear and actionable because it's, especially as gamers, it's like, oh, this is cool, and that's cool, and I want to know this, and I want to, what are you going to do with it? Okay, there's only so much time and energy. You know, what are, what are the three things? So if it's balancing, you know, specifically, what do I want out of, I want to care, I care if it's balanced or not, or if it's, I want to know if they, if the rules make sense, you know, blind play test, whatever. The more specific, again, there's that word, you can be on what you want to get out of it, and what's actionable. If I know the answer to this question without any more information, that's key. If I know the answer to this question without any more information, can I take action? Because if the answer is no, you need a new question. I'm gonna say that again. This is really important if you're doing any kind of like give me feedback, get research, whatever. When there's a, a question, you're asking them to give me the answer to this question. Do this research, do this play test, whatever. When they answer the question, and it has to be a very clear way to answer it, not a you know, long paragraph, can I take action or do I need more information? Because you'd be surprised how many times people ask a question and then they realize afterwards, oh, I still need to know three more things. Or I made an assumption with this question that I didn't verify. And it, it doesn't work well. Um, Okay, where was I? Oh, confirm, yeah, make sure you have delivery dates. What I do when I start a con uh, freelance contract is I, because you might have general timeline, I create a calendar. They have the calendar. These are the dates things need to be done. That sounds very mean, but it's the way to do it. Choose your check-ins. Don't ignore your check-ins, look at them. If something is off, then this is also very important, and it happens, and sometimes it's just, legitimate miscommunication, you need, to, you need to call them and say something's not right here. And please be polite and professional. I have some friends that are freelancers and the stories that I've heard about how rude people can be. I'm sure you have your own horror stories. You know, 
as, give people the benefit of the doubt. They might, it might be off simply because it's off, not because they had any evil nefarious purposes in mind. You know, maybe it's a take that, but probably not. And, you know, just talk to them, have the contract, go back to the contract, go back to any written documentation you have because a lot of times you can refer back to it and say, hey, this is what we agreed. And they'll say, oh, yeah, nine times out of 10, it gets fixed. And pay in a timely fashion, we talked about that. And pay it forward too. If you have a freelancer that you've worked with that you like, tell other people. It helps your friends, colleagues, whatever. And it helps the freelancer because you want them to stay in business. There's um, the, the illustrator that I found on DeviantArt all those years ago, I introduced her, I'm in a writer's group. I introduced her to my writer's group. Now sometimes it's hard to get my work done by her <laughs> because they love her so much. <laughs> um, but you know, she still makes time for me because I did that. And I do all these things too. So she, you know, she'll still do work for me. Okay, this is, there's that, I promised that um, QR code again if you want to get my presentation. And I've left time for questions or for you to get water and go on a bathroom break. Because I know I am very, I'm very much a type A time person. So do anybody have any questions or things you feel like I didn't answer that I said I would? <laughs> Actually, that's, I did a photo shoot with this lady. Um, and I did get, and I made sure I bought the rights that I could use the images in all these different ways. So yes. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> what? I do have earrings in. Why? No, earrings made of that. Oh, earrings. <laughs> um, Steve's suggesting I have earrings made of that? No. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Get earrings of myself. That's a little too meta for me. <laughs> Anybody else? Mm. Who gets a dollar in numbers first? Do you oh. Have a budget or do they come in with a bid? Oh, yes. Okay. So the question was about budget. Thank you. Um, that's that could be a whole nother talk, but I will give you my high level answer to that. The question is about who gives the number first. If you have a very constrained budget, be upfront about it. There is nothing more annoying than getting down because I'm I, in a sense because I consult. And there's nothing more annoying. You start talking to someone and then all of a sudden they're like. Yeah, and I can pay you $200 for a week, week's worth of work. Um, no, I give to charity already. Thank you very much. And so if you have, sometimes artists are willing to work with you, okay? So you can put out that this is my budget. This is what, again, what are the things you're trying to accomplish? Can you do it? Can you do part of it? So if, it's, if it is a really tight budget, just tell them. Sometimes they'll work with you and sometimes they'll say they can't. Now, if they're a more established artist, so when I went with um, James No, he's the uh, current, uh, Hong Kong guy that uh, is doing my steampunk art, he's an established artist. He has set rates. So I'm like, what are your rates? <laughs> you know, and then I have to decide, am I gonna cough up the money or not? Now, you can still negotiate. It never hurts to ask. Um, you can say, look, if I'm giving you, you know, bulk work versus one thing, you know, then a lot of times you can get them to give you like a project price versus a one-off. So if you can give them more work, they will give you a discounted rate. That's pretty common with freelancers. So I guess my answer is it depends. Um, and, but if, if you're on a really tight budget, just tell people up front because otherwise you're just going to annoy people. Um, and you'd be surprised. Sometimes people are like, yeah, I can make that work. That's the nice thing about, um, at least it used to be true. I don't know if it still is art station and deviant art used to have pricing on it. I don't know if they still do. So like pricing, meaning like people, some people put their prices out there. This is what I charge. Um, and the rate can be, I mean, to get a single full color illustration with no background <laughs> can, I've seen as low as $15. I've seen as high as over a thousand. So it really depends. And some of it's going to depend on if they're talented or not. I mean, like if they're not talented, but if they're uh, if they have a the portfolio, um, like someone who's done a bunch of board game covers already, 
And there are a couple artists who have done a number of well-known board game covers. That's going to cost you a lot more. Um, and, and just as a general tip in negotiation, I usually like to let the other person give a number first. Um, but if they won't, or you're, if you're on a tight budget, then just tell them. I found that some of those sites in their form, they have you say, what is your budget? Mm. Which feels like saying the number first, because mm -hmm. it comes, from back, comes back and says, I accept your bid. And that's like, that, that was mm. a bid, that was, that was budget, right? So, right. Uh, I felt a little sort of forced into oh. saying the number first. So the comment about, ooh, multiple, sus oh, it doesn't show up. I'm having a, I'm getting a suspicious software um, notification um, about feeling forced into it. That's why I like with Instagram, you can contact them directly. And what I would do is start with, this is the project I'm working on. Does it interest you? Because seriously, if you can pique their interest as an artist, they might give a little more. <laughs> if you just start with, here's the money, sign my contract. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I think I still got us out with five minutes to spare. So, you know, yay. Thank you.